The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to him, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, she is sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Yesterday afternoon, I had the privilege, uh, well, yet this weekend, I had the privilege of attending a training uh, down in Corpus. You think here is humid? Don't go to Corpus. <laughs> it was very humid down there. But it was a great conference. Um, a few other folks from Abiding Presence went with me. Um, and we learned about what it is to live our life of faith as disciples. Um, one of the, the biggest intentions at this training was to help us define vocation in a way that we can understand the priesthood of all believers better. This is a phrase that Martin Luther used. In other words, it was a, it was a conference designed to help us understand your ministry in the world, how we're called to live out our faith every day and not just on Sundays or here at church. So today, in the gospel, we have this, the calling of Matthew. And Matthew was called to follow Jesus. He was asked to drop everything he did and to follow Jesus as a student and as a, and as a missionary and as a disciple. Matthew was originally a tax collector, but then called to do something different. His vocation was tax collector but he had many other roles in life, as do we. This special call was to be a disciple. And so then after Matthew's call, I think it's kind of cool that Matthew writes about his own call, by the way. It's kind of like he's like, so this dude came up to me. I was sitting in my tax collector booth and asked me to come along with him. And I thought, sure, why not? But after he's called, Jesus starts to show the disciples what ministry looks like. He's eating and someone with, with, uh, with others, and someone comes to him from the synagogue asking him if he can heal their daughter. And so he gets up to go and heal. And as he's walking along, a woman comes along, and she touches his cloak because she also wants to be healed. It's a great symbol of the fact that Jesus has come not only for the people that he knows that are in the synagogue per se, but also those that he doesn't know. We're called to ministry with all sorts of different people. And this gospel takes place just before uh, chapter 10, where, in which Jesus sends out the 12 on mission into the communities. So he calls the disciples, 
he shows them what ministry is all about, and then he sends them out to do ministry. <clears throat> now back to Matthew. He's a tax collector who goes to be a disciple. But there's another tax collector in the Gospels that we talk about. Anybody know who that is? You guys don't count because you've heard it twice now. <laughs> Anybody else? Just shout it out. Okay, Zacchaeus. The answer is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And he is sitting one day in a tree, listening and watching what Jesus is doing. And Jesus is moved by what he sees, and he says to Zacchaeus, come on down out of the tree. I'm going to go eat dinner at your place tonight. And Zacchaeus is surprised, but they go and they have dinner. And it's such a moving show of love and grace that he is transformed. And so he asks Jesus what he can do to follow, and Jesus doesn't call him to follow him like Matthew. He says, stay a tax collector. But all the stuff that you've cheated people out of, give back to them. And then go about being a tax collector in a fair way. Take care of people. Be a tax collector who serves their neighbor through justice. Zacchaeus is called to serve his neighbor just as Matthew is. And we're called because of Christ's love and forgiveness and grace. So now in the Lutheran church, we claim the priesthood of all believers. This is, in other words, we are all called to ministry, to share the gospel of Christ with others in a variety of ways. Sometimes we might refer to ourselves as the body of Christ. Sometimes we use academic words like diakonia, but that's not important. All of these phrases and words are really just meant to help us understand that being Christian and living out the various roles we have in life are all mixed together. They're all connected and intertwined. Our vocation, your vocation, is to live out your faith in all the ways that you live. Or again, in other words, to ask, how is what I am doing serving my neighbor, and why is this important? What if everything you did, you thought of as ministry? Would that change how you feel about what you were doing? Would it change what you do? I have to admit that in my very public role as pastor in this particular calling, when I'm wearing my collar, I am much more aware of my actions than when I'm not like when I'm driving. I wonder what my actions will say about me as a person of faith for sure, because I don't want to give the wrong impression, and I'm quite obviously a person of faith when I wear the collar, and so I want to make sure that people see what a loving Christian example of serving your neighbor is. So does it change the way I do things? I, I prefer to think it doesn't, but in reality, it does sometimes because I think of it as ministry. What if everything you did, you thought of as ministry? Would that or could it give meaning and purpose to all that you do? Would it begin a process of mindfulness or thoughtfulness about all our choices? What would ministry look like in our own homes, in our careers, as citizens? as churchgoers, people of faith. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Pastor Heather, if everything we do is ministry, why do we pay you? Aren't you working yourself out of a job? Well, sort of, but no. My job or vocation is very specific to teaching and renewing and leading other Christians in their life of faith in a called in particular way, and that's outlined in my letter of call, and the charges that I commit to at my ordination. But what you may not realize is that you and I and all of us are also ordained at our baptism to bear Christ's love to the world. You, in fact, might have a more important job than me or Pastor Steve because typically the people we work with already know about God. They're already trying to have a life of faith, at least. The amount of time I spend with people who haven't heard about the gospel is pretty minimal. 
So that means what you do is really important. And it also doesn't mean that coming to church and spending time with church and doing ministries here at church isn't important. We do ministry in the world as a community of faith. We pool our resources and our time, our money, our hearts together to do things to lift each other up and support each other and out in our own local communities. And that's important work too. But the bottom line is, all that we do in all our roles in life is an opportunity for ministry. They're each a vocation in and of themselves. And in these roles, maybe you would mention your faith, maybe you would speak of Jesus, maybe you wouldn't, but it's still ministry. Martin Luther likes to talk about the shoemaker whose ministry is to make shoes. And so he makes the best shoes that he can to serve the neighbors so they have something to protect their feet and keep them comfortable. What if we balanced our lives with gathering among God's people for learning and support and the good that we can do together with what we do in our own lives outside of church as ministry? What if we stopped feeling guilty about not adding more church to our schedule but adding, thinking of how our schedules become our ministry? Finally, perhaps maybe the most important thing to remember is that our vocation the ministry that we do is not so that we get salvation or inherit salvation or to prove that we're Christian. The how we do ministry is important, but the why is just as important. What we do as Christians, we are called to our various ministries or vocations in life as Christians, is because of what Christ has already done for us. So we may not be perfect in ministry, and that's okay. God knows I am not. But we are called to do ministry for the sake of Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ. God's work, our hands. What if all you did, you did as ministry? What would that change? Amen.